Yes, uh, we do. But um, do you want them? G'day everyone, good to see you. Thanks for coming along. We're hoping this will be a really encouraging time where we're equipped and inspired to, to lead people to know Jesus better. That's, that's our aim, isn't it, in home groups? And um, I just wanted to just go through a few um, reminders. First up, we're going to basically hear from Lyndon. He's going to be talking to us about how to lead better inductive Bible studies. And we're going to hear from Nick, uh, an overview of Philippians. We're going to hear a little taster of what it what it means to help your group pray better from fee if she makes it in and uh, basically because our topic for next oh there she is our topic for next time is prayer so each time we're doing a skill so this time we're doing leading inductive studies next time it's prayer the one after that is on having pastoral conversations but so that so fee's going to give us a little taster and then we're also going to spend some time in um, small groups, twos and threes, just praying for our groups together. Okay, so just, Linda, just, just throw up a, a, um, these slides for me just quickly. What's, uh, yeah, we've got the graphic. See, th so this is just to remind us that the point of home groups is not just to read the Bible together uh, with a bunch of friends. Uh, it's not even just to be a bunch of friends and do life together. It's kind of more than that. It involves that, but it's about encouraging each other to mature in Christ. So it means working on our prayer <clears throat> that we pray um, more in a Christ-centered and gospel-hearted way, not just about our own problems. You know, when we we um, we think about applying the Bible, not just isn't it good that the Bible said that. So this is um, I know it should go without saying, but I, I just need to be reminded of that picture. That's what God's doing across history, and according to Colossians 1, and our role <coughs> is to help, to be a helper of that. So it's not on our own, the Holy Spirit's our helper, and uh, we're his helper. Okay, and next one, um, thanks brother, is just the next couple of uh, dates, so if you can put that mm -hmm. as a side, that would be really good. And please bring core members, because we want to <laughs> open this up for as many people as possible, um, I mean, our, our basic idea is that we have one or two people in each group who are, th who are the overall leaders. But there's some of you here who are, who are core members, who you have a real heart for the group and you might lead in prayer occasionally, you might be the organisers, you, you'll be the other chip components. And uh, you are, believe it or not, the future leaders as well. And we want you to not just be trained up in what you do, but also have your eye on the fact that one day as the, as the church grows, we've got to grow the number of groups. Um, I've really been aware of this uh, recently. We've got something like uh, 10 new people knocking on the door saying, want to join a group. And a lot of you are, are quite full already. And so where do we put those people? And we're only not even halfway through the year. So um, we need to be even thinking about splitting at the end, before the end of the year if some of you are up for that. But bring your core members because hopefully it'll get them excited and inspired and they, they will want to jump into that role as well okay what's the next one Lyndon so here's our leader supporters now I'm telling you about these before but here they are okay so we've got at the moment we've got six people in this role of leader support and you'll notice that hopefully every group is represented underneath so <clears throat> I wonder if we can get so we've got Tim who's not here right now Tim Smith he's um getting ready for Tokyo Field Days, but we've got Ken, who's sitting right here, Cassie, uh, is over there, and Fee, who's over there, Lyndon, who's on the PowerPoint, and me. So between us, what we're trying to do is meet with a leader from every group once a term. And the idea is not just to, um, to just say g'day and how you going, but we want to uh, encourage everyone to grow in that towards maturity in Christ. So for example, one, one thing that you may want to work out from today is that you want to grow in a certain area. We're looking at Philippians. Philippians talks a lot about humility, talks about love, it talks about um, growing in joy. And it might be that you decide that your group 
wouldn't it be great if our group was just grew more in humble service that we could see that in some way now if you could talk that over with your leader support person they will then pray with you and um, help towards your group becoming more gospel centered more um, you know more t moving to, to the right moving towards maturity in Christ in that particular aspect so that's our that's our plan with leader support we just think every leader should be met up with at least once a, once a term so if you have any um, input on that please let us know if it's too much if it's not enough whatever um, but that's what we're trying to do okay, I think that's it, isn't it Lyndon got, yeah that's it okay so I'm gonna hand over to um, Nick and he's gonna take us through the Philippians how about I start us in, I'll just continue in prayer Lord we thank you for this time together uh, we pray that you'll please sharpen us and strengthen us in this role that you've given us to grow disciples of yours and we pray that our church might be full of people who are wholehearted in their devotion to you and that our home groups will be great places of encouragement and growth and joy and friendship and we pray this in Jesus name amen thanks mate Thanks, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the nice thing about Philippians, as opposed to last time I came up here, is that we know a heck of a lot about the context of it, unlike Exodus, where we know very little about it, even down to the dates of it. Um, we actually have a, know a lot about Philippi and a lot about Philippians. There's not going to be a quiz at the end of this, don't worry. Um, there is a lot of information on this PowerPoint, but I'm going to send it out to you at the end. And it's also got some links to some other things that you can listen to if you're after uh, some further information on any of this. But uh, I'm also going to send it out to you so that as we go into the first, um, first 11 verses this week, if you want to be teaching a bit of this context stuff to your group, then you're more than welcome to use some of these slides or all of these slides or whatever you want, uh, if you feel that that would be helpful for your group. And also stop me at any time if you've got any questions, and I'll see if I can answer them. So here's what we're going to have a quick look, quick overview of Philippians. We're going to look at the context of Philippi the city, the Philippian church itself, and then the letter that we actually have in our Bibles. Then I'll give you a quick outline of the letter itself, the four chapters. We'll have a quick look at the key themes and then I'll show you the study outline that we're actually going through this term. So first of all, Philippi was established in around 356 BC by Philip II, who was the father of Alexander the Great. So um, it was an important city near great resources of gold and it became famous in around 42 BC when Brutus and Cassius fled there after stabbing Julius Caesar which, if, has anyone read Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare? Yeah, I haven't, and I'm an English teacher. But <laughs> that phrase like, et tu Brutus, uh, comes from this place. So they flee there. Um, it leads to the Battle of Philippi, where some 200,000 Romans were all fighting each other, one of their biggest civil wars. Uh, and eventually Brutus and Cassius are put to death. And it's such a strategic place that the new Caesar uh, leaves a Roman colony there. And it eventually becomes known as Little Rome. So, it, and this is something that we actually read in the Bible as well as our history books. In Acts 16, 12, uh, Luke says this, From there we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And that's around Acts 16 because every now and then you'll come across somebody who says that Luke made it all up or he had no idea what was actually happening. But then you get verses like Acts 16, 12, which... He mentions Philippi and just mentions offhandedly, oh yeah, it was a Roman colony. And as we look into the history of Rome and the history of this area, we find that that's exactly what happened. And so the history books actually line up perfectly with, with uh, the biblical account of what's going on. Uh, and then there's, there's a sermon there which when I email this out, if you want to listen to that, then uh, Pastor Paul Martin from Canada does a really good job of overviewing uh, the context of this city, Philippi. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so that's where it is. There, it's sort of um, it's sort of on in between uh, Asia and Europe. Although it only had 10,000 people, it was outsized in its importance due to its location on the Ignatian Way, which is that road that goes all the way through. 
Uh, it was one of the first highways that went through Europe and Asia, around 1,120 kilometres. And so it was a very important town. Uh, being a hub of business and military activity. Like I said, it was called Little Rome. It was a, this city that spoke Latin, had Roman architecture, dress and laws, and it was smack bang in the middle of Greece and Turkey. So although it was Roman, everything around it was Greek or uh, Turkish. And so that, that um, makes this city very important. Uh, that's just a, a diagram of what we have from the archaeological records, um, which you can have a look at if you'd like. Next slide. Um, here's what we read, though, from Acts 16. Uh, this, is one of the, this is one of the churches that we get a lot of information about how it was established. Uh, it happened right at the beginning of Paul's secondary missionary, second missionary journey, and it says this, Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region, region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. A couple of important things in this part of Acts. First of all, that's the first mention of we got ready at once, which would seem to indicate that this is where Luke actually started following along with the journeys. Um, the second one, it's very obvious from this passage that God wanted a church planted in Philippi. Uh, they wanted to go one way and the Spirit of God said no. They wanted to go another way and the Spirit of God said no. And then a third time, Paul gets this vision of this big, burly Macedonian bloke saying, come to Macedonia and help us. And so Paul says, all right, that's where we're going. Clearly, God wanted a church established in Philippi, this super strategic city. And then the funny part is we then read what actually got established in that city. If we can go to the next slide. The first converts in Philippi, when Paul gets there, the very first person to become a Christian there is Lydia, who's this businesswoman from Theatira and her household. And so this big, burly Macedonian man in the dream ends up being this little Asian businesswoman, which is, I find, amusing. Uh, and then we've got the story of this demon-possessed slave girl and the jailer and his household, where they're put into jail and the earthquake happens and they're freed. And these are the... These are the um, founding members of the church in Philippi. And there's a pastor called Roger Burgess who preached on this passage recently, last year in fact. Uh, and he said this, the church in Philippi should never have gotten off the ground. The barriers between these founding members were so thick that no human power could break them. There was the ethnic barrier, social barriers. The TikTok version of this story goes like this. Did you hear about the rich Turkish businesswoman, the exploited Greek slave girl, and the middle-class Italian jailer? You'll never believe it. They all met Jesus and formed the first church in Philippi. The gospel breaks through all barriers. That's the church. It's this mixture of cultures, this mixture of classes. Um, and it's a reflection of what the church would look like going forward. It's a Gentile church as well, which is also a very interesting thing. Which brings us to Paul's letter. We know a lot about Paul's, Paul's letter directly from uh, the letter itself. We know he wrote it from prison, but which prison he was in is a point of dispute because he was in many prisons throughout his ministry. Uh, some, of, some of those prisons are named, others he only alludes to. The most likely scenario is that he's in prison in Rome at this point, around 62 AD, which is based off chapter 1. It's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. But there are also arguments that this letter could have come earlier during a prison stay much closer to Philippi because the letter reports four trips between Paul and Philippi, and it also projects four more trips that may happen soon, which would suggest the communication between them is frequent, which means it could be he's imprisoned in the mid-50s or in Caesarea in 59 to 60. Ultimately, does it really matter which prison he was in? Well, not overly, but it's something of interest. Uh, there's also a possibility that what we have as the letter 
to Philippians in our Bible is made up of either one, two, or three letters that Paul sent. I mean, there's a possibility it could be four or five or six, but um, there could be a division at the end at the end of chapter two into the beginning of chapter three, where Paul seems to be wrapping up, and then he continues on for another two chapters. That could indicate that this is actually a compilation of two letters. Um, but either way, the letter or letters are presenting an ongoing conversation between Paul and the Philippian church. Uh, and they all present this continuity of tone and theme. Now, personally, I reckon it was always one letter. I think it's, there's enough continuity in it to say that. But I bring that up just because this is, again, one of those things where some people will say, well, we can't trust the Bible because that was never just one letter. It was actually two or three letters. And so what we have isn't actually God's Word. Well, God's Word isn't dependent on whether it was one letter or two letters or three letters. God's Word is still in these letters, in this communication between Paul and the church that God established through him. And so I bring this up to show that we're not surprised by people making these arguments uh, and we're not flustered by it. Uh, was it one letter? Was it two letters? I don't know. I think one personally, but if someone's going to argue that it was actually two, I'm not going to lose my faith over it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Um, so that's, that's just a little bit more context to the particular letter that we have in our Bibles now. Over to the next slide, please. Sorry? Ah, oh, yep, sorry. Uh, so audience, Philippians, predominantly Gentile audience, as I said. Um, there's also arguments from within the letter to suggest that. Usually when Paul quotes the Old Testament, he says, it is written, whereas in Philippians we don't find that anywhere. Uh, but he does make lots of references to the Old Testament, but he just sort of alludes to it. For example, every knee should bow in 2.10 or fragrant offering in 4.18, but he doesn't quote the chapter and verse like he does in some other in some other letters, which would suggest that he's not speaking to a Jewish audience, but rather he's speaking to a Gentile audience. And it's great because it means that as we read Philippians, we can understand it in, in its entirety and there's no foreknowledge needed in order to understand Philippians. But the more we understand our Old Testament, uh, the more of Paul's allusions become apparent and Philippians actually grows in its beauty the more we understand that Old Testament where he's coming from. Uh, and as we study it, uh, there's a lot of, lot of very famous verses in Philippians, but as we study it in its context, I think those verses will become even richer and more beautiful for us. Uh, so those, so based on the, th actually before I go on to this one, does anyone, can anyone think of any memory verses that they know from Philippians? What are the most famous ones? Rejoice in the Lord. Yep. Jesus Christ in very nature God did not grasp hold of his place on the throne. Yep. Any others? The other most famous one that people get tattooed before footy games. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, yes, which is not about winning, winning soccer games, but is actually about contentment. Uh, yeah, so a couple, couple of famous, famous Philippian verses there. Uh, Philippians is one of Paul's most encouraging letters. The church of Philippi was, was the first church he founded in Europe, and he did spend some time there, visiting several times. He also received several gifts from them, and in this particular letter, Paul is imprisoned, probably in Rome, and is writing to thank them for their gift, delivered through a bloke named Epaphroditus. And he also wants to encourage them in their growing faith. Now, he does make one point of correction to two ladies, Euodia and Syntyche, uh, towards the end of the letter. But apart from that one correction, the tone is consistently joyful and encouraging. The words joy or happiness are mentioned 16 times in these four chapters, which, if you've read any of other, Paul's other letters, you'll see is actually quite um, different. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, when, it's, when it's viewed as one letter, we see this remarkable thematic continuity. This is a quote from a scholar, that's why the language is a bit fancier. <laughs> um, and here's, here's some of the themes that G. Walter Hansen found. He said, the themes are progress in the faith, standing firm in the Lord, humility, suffering, and the final victory of Christ. And these are the key themes that bring it together. Like I said, I'll send this to you so you don't need to uh, memorize these or write them down. Another scholar, um, this one's from the Introduction on the Gospel Coalition, 
uh, lists about eight themes there, making progress in our lives, proper spiritual outlook, Christ is the supreme example, suffering will come, prayer is crucial, the gospel is not individualistic, it's about community, the old covenant and Jesus is fully God and fully man are all these issues that come up when we read Philippians. If we go to the next one. Um, there's three problems that face the church that Paul outlines, and they're disunity, suffering, and opponents. And so he gives the Philippian church different ways to handle each of these different issues that are arising against their church. Next one, please. But the key theme that we're going to be honing in on with our particular study is this idea of following examples. Uh, Gordon Fee said this, the aim is to persuade toward one kind of behaviour and to dissuade from another. At the heart of these two sections are the best known materials in the letter, the Christ story in chapter 2 and Paul's stories in chapter 3. In both sections, he explicitly says that the narratives have been given to serve as models for the Philippians' own way of thinking and of behaviour appropriate to such a mindset. So Paul's idea in Philippians is look to Christ as an example and imitate me as I imitate Christ. Uh, he also gives examples from the Philippian church themselves of Timothy and Epaphroditus that they should be following. Uh, he, and so it's about this is how you should act, this is what you shouldn't, how you shouldn't act. Uh, follow me as I follow Christ. So that's, that's really how we've structured the outlines for this particular series. Um, so here's, we've got eight, eight sermons from four chapters. We've got Paul's welcome, Paul's circumstances, and then chapter two, which is Christ's example, which is that beautiful hymn in the middle of it, where Paul just bursts into song in the middle of a letter. Uh, then we've got Timothy and Epaphroditus examples. We've got two weeks on Paul's example. He starts off by looking at the negative. This is, this is who I used to be, and this is what you shouldn't be imitating. And then the second week on, but this is how you should be imitating me as I imitate Christ. Uh, and then he looks to the Philippian church themselves, overcoming their negative examples, but then pointing out, to conclude his letter, all of these positive examples that he's found within this particular church that they should be imitating. And so that's, that's what we'll be doing for the next eight weeks. Are there any questions? Cool, well, I'll email this out to you this afternoon. Like I say, you're free to uh, use any parts of this with your group if you feel that would be helpful. And if any questions do come up from your group throughout the next eight weeks, please do uh, let me know straight away so that we can get help you get an answer to it. Thanks. Yeah. I read through the letter and looked where I thought the most natural breaks would be. Uh, yeah, I actually watched that after I'd already done this. So, yeah, it's pretty similar. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there's a cu couple of differences. Um, I've split Paul's example into two because I think there's a lot in there. Um, for what it's worth, um, I, one church that I looked at did Philippians over six months of 45-minute sermons each. <laughs> We're doing it in eight weeks. <laughs> Um, but even then, you will find that some of the studies are a lot shorter than we've been used to from Exodus. Some of them are only, well, like this week is only 11 verses long, which means that we'll need um, to really be uh, using our Bible study skills well to get stuff out of people, which is why Lyndon's here to show us how to do that. And with that amazing segue, I'll hand over to him.
Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have been sitting for a bit, so I'm just going to hand out uh, some things we'll be using during this time. We've got about 40 minutes, um, so I'll hand these out. You don't need to read these yet. We'll be using them in a moment, um, but feel free to get up and stretch your legs and do star jumps or something to get the blood flowing again, um, and we'll get into it in about oh, 30 seconds. There's one more here, if anyone needs. All right, so as I said, we don't need to have a look through that. I'll give you time shortly to do so. Um, but I guess firstly, just as an introduction, okay, so Steve asked me to come and uh, talk a bit about using this term inductive. We'll have a look at that in a moment, because I don't know if that's a word that everyone uses in their regular vocabulary. Um, but to talk a bit about the Swedish method, which would fall under that idea of inductive uh, Bible studies, um, not because I've done a degree in the Swedish method or anything like that, but it is, it's the main form um, of Bible study that I've led for the last maybe six or so years. So it's something that I've been doing for a while um, and, yeah, thinks really helpful. Um, I think I can speak on behalf of Steve saying this isn't something that's you know, mandated. We're not saying everyone has to do home group like this, but it's a tool that you can use or a way of setting up and structuring uh, your home group um, to meet those goals that we have, to help people mature in Christ, engage with the Bible themselves. So hand up if you have done this sort of thing before with your home group. Right, so most of us are sort of familiar, some uh, haven't. So as we go through, um, yeah, please feel free to ask questions, but well, actually, there'll be time for that because we're going to do the Swedish method. Um, so let's get into it. Can you jump the next slide there, Steve? So often when we're given uh, a study for us to do with a group, whether that be one you, know, you buy from the shops or one the church gives us or one even you write yourself. Um, go, Steve, go. Uh, sometimes you're following questions and you've set an idea in your mind that's very much predetermined. It's something you've done before you're there with your group in person. Keep going. So you might be looking at the questions and going, no, do these actually suit my group, my context, the people that I have in front of me each week? Um, as you're looking through, sometimes there's been a particular flow or thought that the person who wrote the study has, if it wasn't you, and it can be sometimes hard for you as a leader to follow that and really know where it's going and what you're trying to achieve each part of the way. Um, and yeah, that idea of, is it relevant to, you know, we've got groups that are not even each group made up of lots of different individuals, but even each group have different demographics in there, and each of their own particular situations and stages, um, and relevance is a big thing when we're looking at the Bible and making sure what we're doing is relevant for the people in front of us. Um, so sometimes it can be a struggle for that, and also participation can really vary. You'll have people that are really vocal and want to jump in every time you ask a question, others that just sort of sit there and you have no idea whether they're even listening, let alone um, it's making a difference for them. Um, and often when we have sort of, I guess, typical sort of question-answer groups, it can sometimes be we're just trying to get an answer that sort of makes sense and then we just move on without necessarily um, thinking a bit more deeply about uh, what's in the text and um, what we think it says. So when we're talking about the Swedish method, yes, but this idea of deductive and inductive studies, um, this attempts to overcome some of those things. And so just to talk about what deductive and inductive, often that's referred to when you're talking about a uh, scientific way of doing things. Um, when we're talking about it in 
our context, this idea of deductive is we take ideas, so a theory or some concept, and we try and see, we either in the scientific way of things, we do an experiment and see if that proves that theory correct. Or if we're looking at, in this context, just the next one, Steve there, and again, um, we're thinking the ideas that we bring to the text, we're trying to look and go, does it match? Right? Does the idea that we had before match what we see in the text? So it's almost like we're bringing ideas and seeing if we can confirm that in the text before us. When we're thinking about inductive, it's really about, let's not think about other ideas first, let's go to the text first and see what we can learn and what ideas come from that, um, come up with uh, yeah, those pattern or way of thinking from the text. So that's what we mean when we're th talking about inductive studies or the Swedish method, which is a very basic form of inductive study. It all starts with the text and then coming up with ideas and understanding from that. Um, so I just want to clarify that in case that's unfamiliar to you. Right. I thought I'd have the computer with me. I thought we might be in one of the classrooms, so I've sort of done it paragraph or line by line. So bear with us as we go through. So when we're talking about the Swedish method, um, the big idea is that we're wanting the group to be able to engage with the Bible for themselves and the idea of relevance of where they are at. And one of the big parts of that is it's about those participants, the group members. It centres on them rather than it feeling like it's all about you having to teach and explain and you've got to have the answers for everything and it's very much leader-centred. Um, so we're wanting to move away from that idea with the Swedish method to it being very much about the participants in your group. Now, normally, um, the way I run this, and so we're going to do the Swedish method on the Swedish method, a um, bit of inception there. So what I'd normally do is we have like a little whiteboard or something, and I'll give out a piece of paper to everyone in the group, um, which they'd uh, participate. There'll be three bits of paper for each sort of section of the way this is structured. and We'd read the particular text and they would have a look and write down their first thing on the piece of paper. I'd collect all the paper, we'd put it up on the whiteboard and sort of go through it. So we're getting um, everyone participating in that way. Now, the logistics of that would be a bit difficult with a few more people than we normally have at our Wednesday night home group. So we're going to try an online version. Um, can we do this, uh, just to save us having probably like 30 people all doing this at once, if we maybe pair up with someone next to you or if you're like, I don't know how to use this technology stuff, maybe if someone else can sit next to you. All you need is access to the internet, so if you've got your phone there, just go to menti.com and enter in that code or you can use the QR code if that's easier for you um, and that'll take you there and it's going to ask you the first question. But before you can jump in, um, as in start putting your answers into here, we're going to be looking at the text. So our text, rather than the Bible today, is going to be that article that you've got. Um, so I'll give you a second, can I just make sure everyone can get into there? Um, right. So we'll start off with making sure everyone can get in, and then, well, you know, there should just be, as in, Three? As in, yeah, the last one's blank, yes. So, yeah, that's a lot more than you'd normally do in a Bible study, um, but this is probably not as, I guess, you're not pulling out as much each verse as you would in a Bible study, so I've given us a bit more to go through. So what I'd like you to do, so the first part is we're looking for light bulbs, so things that stand out to you as you read it. So as you're looking through, I want you to read through the whole thing, um, the whole article, and then you're going to have a look at particular light bulbs. So just leave it there, Steve, don't keep going through. Um, we'll use the mentee thing in a second. So let me just give you a couple of minutes to read through that article either by yourself or with the person next to you. A couple more minutes and a couple of minutes. Yeah, so we're not doing anything, all you're doing is just reading through at the moment. Often in home group, we'd read through this together, the passage, but I'll let you do it silently for the moment.
Once you have finished reading through the passage, you can jump back to menti.com. Um, the code's still up on the screen if you didn't see that before. And we're putting in light bulbs. So it does have a description there about something that shines out from the passage. What's something that stood out to you, something that impacted you, something um, that drew your attention. Um, and just a sentence you can put in there. I think you can submit multiple if you see next to someone else that wants to put in there. But um, yeah, so once you finish the passage, jump to menti.com and follow those instructions for light bulbs. And your responses will jump up on the screen. So it is anonymous as well. One last instruction, when you're putting in your light bulb sentence, can you put in, I've got little numbers next to the paragraphs, can you just put maybe in brackets what number, paragraph that um, light bulb comes from? So you're not having to write out a particular sentence in there, just your idea, the thing that stood out, the thing that impacted you or drew your attention. Um, there might have been heaps of things, just choose one, put the verse number, or the paragraph number, I should say, and write in what it was that stood out. Um, and if you want to do it with the person next to you, so we have less than you know, 30 responses up there, that's a good idea. All right, so there's a bunch up there that you can see. Um, you don't have to put your names there. I can see some people have chosen to. But that's fine. You can leave it anonymous if you like as well. Um, and you should be able to scroll, Steve, and if there's, see if there's any... Um, so on the pad, just do two-finger scroll up or down. There might be all there is. Oh, there should be some. Yeah, that's it. All right. um, so how I'd normally organise this if we're at home group looking through a passage is put them up in order. So of like you know, verse 1 through to verse whatever. So we can sort of work through the passage of people's light bulbs that came in numerical 
order or the flow of the passage anyway. A um, little harder to do it with this technology. Um, but what we do is, as the leader, I'm usually there putting them up as people are handing them to me. Um, and I'd read out the particular light bulb and open up for the person who wrote it to expand on it. So maybe they just had a couple of words and they want to then add a bit more, so verbally. So we have some members of the group who hate trying to write down their thoughts into this nice, concise thing. So they just write a couple of words and then when I read theirs out, then they then verbally explain it um, to the rest of the group. Um, there's others that just want to write it down and don't want to say anything to it. They don't want to talk about it after they've put it up. Um, and that's fine as well. I guess one of the big things is that it lets everyone participate in a particular way. Um, very non-threatening when it can be anonymous. You don't have to write your name on it. You just put it up on the board and someone else reads it out. Um, so they're still participating. And as the leader, you can see who's putting them in. So you can get an idea of who's doing what. Um, but it's enabling participation across the board. Um, and we can work through and see what are those, those light bulbs, those things that were important, that were impactful, that came through for everyone. So I'd also try and group ones that were similar together. Now, there's probably a few too many uh, to try and do that, but Steve, can you scroll to the top of those and we'll just read out a few. If anyone wants to add, they're more than welcome to jump in um, and yeah, add any extra thoughts or um, also open it up to other members of the group to add comment to a particular one that someone's written in as well. Um, so things like building confidence in Scripture alone. Um, we can begin by asking God to speak through his word. Uh, so it's, this is probably before I mentioned to put the verse in. That's something that's important as well to get the verse in there so we know it's coming from the text. Um, requires no p preparation. Uh, great that that stood out to you. It stood out to me as well. Uh, and so we're going to go into questions after this. So often things will come up here that we're like, actually, I want to ask about that. So things that might come up in the light bulbs, the next section we're going to do is questions. Um, so that person might want to then follow that up with a question uh, from there. Um, promotes good observation of the text, uh, engages everyone, um, doesn't rely just on human authority, but gets back to the text. Um, keep scrolling down there, Steve. Um, message, I guess, yeah, coming through unfiltered, if it's us reading the text rather than someone else interpreting and then getting you to answer questions that they've put together on the text. Um, no special resources. Lots of other one, interesting ones put in there as well. <laughs> um, discover what God's saying for themselves. Okay. Our opinions are always tied to the text. Cool. So going through, again, I'm going to do an abbreviated version here with this today, but you'd read through one then still... Stop talking as the leader. Let that person either jump in and maybe they need a bit of prompting. You might go, "Ah, oh, why did that stand out to you if you know who put it up there or sort of open that up to the group. Um, but also you know some people in your group don't want to speak unless they're um, happy to. So yeah, that's when you use your discretion knowing who's in your group as to how much you get them involved. But it is an easy way when they've already got something up there to then invite them just to add a bit more. Just why did you choose that? You're asking them a really easy question. Um, all right, can you swipe back to the presentation for me? And we'll just mention a couple of things about light bulbs before we jump in to the next one. So keep that menti.com page open. We'll come back to that. Um, so a couple of these things we've already spoken about, but light bulbs, uh, having those, that passage, um, verse number next to it, really ensures people get it from the text. It's not just something I heard that's semi-related, but not really. It has to come from the text. Um, speaking there about, yeah, letting the person comment and expand or opening up the discussion. Or you might go, actually, that's not really, really related. I don't care how handsome Chris Henry is. I'm just going to sort of maybe read that one out, but then start reading the next one straight away and not pause on that. So I guess as the leader, you are facilitating the discussion here. Um, and so it's up to you to sort of go, do we linger on this? Or do we not? Um, yeah, make it anonymous. Again, is that easy entry point. And then preparation for this is actually key. I disagree with the article in there. Um, if, if you haven't prepared, oh, sorry, you can do this without preparing. 
right? And there's been times when I've been in that situation, um, and you can still have a fantastic study and really great discussion. Um, but I find it really helpful when you do get to prepare and you actually look through the passage yourself and think about what are those key things. You might read some commentaries, you might read other things and have a really solid idea about the context of the passage and um, what are those big ideas and what are the uh, main points that the writer is um, trying to convey here. And that, I think, that doesn't mean you want to then, when you're say, because I as the you know, leader still put in my own uh, light bulb in there. It doesn't mean that I speak for 15 minutes when my one gets read because I'm just expanding one in to make sure we cover everything. But it means when other people do put points in there that maybe semi-hit on an idea or only capture half of it and you think there's something that's really essential that we cover as well, you can sort of ask a follow-up question. Now, did you think about this part in there or now, why did you put that bit in there? And you can add your two cents, you can sort of prompt others um, to put in there as well. So when you've done that preparation, uh, you can ensure that the questions you ask, um, uh, sorry, the points you do in there and the questions that you then ask to follow up some of these light bulbs, some of those big you know, uh, ideas do still come out and we're making sure that um, we're ready to facilitate a good discussion that's informed. But again, it's not you just wanting to the, sit there and give some lecture to the rest of the group. It's you being able to add in just those key comments and key questions to get people thinking to get that discussion to come from them predominantly. Yes. So when you're asking to expand, the way we do it is I'll just, so we, it's a blank piece of paper, you write on it, I collect them, put them up on our whiteboard using some magnets or blue tack or something, and then I just read, read one, pause, does anyone want to comment on that? I'm not saying that particular person, unless it's someone, one that's a bit vague that we're not sure, and I might go, you've got to read the room, whether they'd be happy to, but you might ask that person just to explain um, why they put that up there. And that's an easy way as well to get someone that hasn't been contributing much to just contribute verbally in some way in the group as well. But you've got to yeah, read the room and see whether they're comfortable with that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, and that's where the flexibility is used as a leader can go, yeah, we move on or we open up to everyone or you ask a particular person or, um, yeah, there's room for your own choice in there. Yeah. Okay, we're going to jump to questions. Um, so, uh, can you go back to the mentee and... Um, Steve, if you can click on Menti, so just swipe back, no, as in swipe to Menti, they, everyone should still be in it, and then if you now click or press across now, the next question should come up, so like the arrow to the right, as in on the keyboard, there we go, so that should come up on your screen now, so again, take a minute, if you haven't thought of questions already, um, have a look through. So you think about what's something that was difficult to understand in there. It might have been something small like the meaning of a particular word or it might be these bigger, more abstract concepts that came up that you're not sure about. Um, write down a question and submit it up here. Again, it's anonymous. Um, and please as well put the verse or paragraph number in there too.
Steve's disappeared on me. All right, so we can see about 10 questions up there already. Um, it is good to hide these before everyone's done so people aren't just looking at others and being guided by others' thoughts or opinions and they can come with it themselves. So similar to the first method, uh, I'd again put these up in verse order, so we'd sort of just work through the questions. There's often similar questions, so we'd sort of group them together and answer them as one. Um, again, it's a bit harder seeing them all up here. Um, and as we go through, um, as the leader, I'm not wanting to be the one that just answers every question. I'll read it out and open it up to the group, even if I'm like, yeah, I know this one, I can answer this. No, I want to open it up to the group first, and again, this is voluntarily, people um, sharing what, yeah, it's responses that they have. Um, so if we have a look at some of these, just for the purpose of understanding the Swedish method a bit better, we'll have a look at some of these questions. We won't be able to answer all of them, um, so we've got yeah, a little under 10 minutes. Um, so... Um, let me have a quick look through here. Right. So one of those, an easy one about what if there's no light bulbs or even no questions, no one does anything. Does anyone have ideas as to how you'd either respond to that or what you'd do, or think that would be a situation in their own home group, that no one would voluntarily write down stuff? Yeah, great. So especially if you're doing this for the first time, giving them examples of what does a light bulb look like? What sort of questions do you ask? Yep. Yep, so having some of the questions that you had from the passage to be able to share as well. Um, I, in yeah, doing this in for yeah, six years or so, I don't think I've had an instance where there's been zero light bulbs or questions. Like people, God speaks through his word, right? Um, and it's also, I guess, yeah, how you set up. If you've they set it up so people are really fearful and every time they put a response, you're like, no, that's not right. Like, well, then they might be a bit afraid to share. But if you've got you know, a group where you've set up the right sort of culture there that you know that everyone's voice is valued and you're not critical of them and it's a real safe place, I, yeah, I don't think you're going to come across that issue too often. Um, just trying to look for any other themes in here. Um, Yeah, so what if there's nothing in there? What if everyone just has no idea about... Are you talking about the answers there to the questions or the light bulbs? Cool, so that's a yeah, good one. Where do we get the answers to the questions from? Um, and yeah, how do we decide what makes sense what seems correct and correct interpretation of that text and um, yeah does anyone have ideas how do you overcome that problem yep
Yeah, great. So, yeah, two really great options there. Um, definitely been in this position before where, yeah, we're not really sure of what the answer to that question is. Um, so that's right, being able to go, yeah, let's look at this, you do some more study, um, have a look at this, work through it in prayer and read what other people, other Christians have thought about it. Um, and then also, yeah, the great thing is we can look at whether it's answered on Sunday or come and talk to the minister that's prepared that sermon, they've probably done a lot of thinking about it as well. Um, if it's in... One of the rules that I have as we answer questions is our, not only must the question come from the passage, but the answer has to come, be interpreted from the passage or other scripture as well. That often takes away this, mm -hmm. I heard someone uh, say once about this question that X, Y, Z. Uh, if you can tie back the responses to what you've already seen in the passage or previous sections um, of the book you're looking at, then that can often provide a lot more clarity and narrow down what the responses are. But there's always going to be questions where there could be multiple interpretations um, and allowing that where there are different interpretations for Christians um, in the Bible as well. So, yeah, we need to know what's black and white and what's some of those areas that are up for discussion as well. Yeah, and one of the great things about this is we're teaching each other in the group how to approach the Bible on our own as well. So when we come to questions that we have in the passage, what do we do with that? Like if you're reading the Bible in the morning by yourself, what do you do when you have questions? Right? So teaching some of those tools, thinking like that, or yeah, where do we go to get more information or who do we speak with, um, are really useful in there. Yeah, that's right, and being able to actually look at those pieces of Scripture that say that, and so that comes back to that idea of we don't want people just answering questions based on something I heard, or doesn't it, the Bible say this somewhere? Like if you're going to give an answer, it needs to, be, it needs to come from somewhere within Scripture. Um, Yeah, and I think one of the big ideas in that article was you don't have to answer all the questions. It's fine for that to be a question that that person goes and investigates. Um, so it's more about being engaging with the passage and being able to yeah, still create that discussion within the study. Awesome, that's great. All right, let's jump on to the last... Oh, sorry, go back to the slideshow for me, Steve. Um, and just, yeah, the next question is just a couple of points. I think we've spoken about most of these. But yeah, the prepare still is really important here. Make sure you've asked all the questions that you have of the passage and sort of done your homework to find out what those responses are as well so that you can help guide discussion around this, um, including that verse number. Again, 
this can be where lots of sidetrack comes up because the question's not really about the passage, it's they're just trying to put in their question that they have about something else that isn't really about the passage. Um, and so ensuring, like when you are running the Swedish method, having those sort of ground rules is that you know, we're wanting to ensure that these questions are coming from the passage. That's a great question, but I think that will be better discussed outside of this time together. And so giving yourself permission and making that clear is that I'm going to say these things as we do this sort of study to help help keep it moving along and making sure we're focusing on what's relevant each week. Um, yeah, getting answers from there and then, as we said, it's okay not to have all the answers to, but coming back to it. All right, application, last one um, within... Um, so it should be on Menti again, but what's the time? Is that quarter? Is that clock correct? Quarter past? Okay, so... Um, application... Can you jump back to Menti then, Steve? And we'll just give you, I'm going to do a quick one. And this is always what happens in the study as well. We always take so long on light bulbs and um, go to present. I, th I think in the top right hand corner, I think because you went out of the slideshow. Did everyone else get kicked off? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So you might have to go back in, um, or if you're already in there, yep. Okay, so let me just give you one minute, write an application, and maybe if you can just press the S letter, get rid of that symbol, and we can see people's responses. <laughs> Use me as the first number, thank you. <laughs> Thinking, application, how is this going to make a difference? How are we going to use what you've discussed, whether it be from the light bulbs? Often application comes up as you're discussing these things. Like it's a natural sort of, I saw this in the passage, it means this for me. And so going, great, hold on to that, keep it for the application, let's chuck it up there. So getting people, everyone to write their own application as well is, you know, it's not just people thinking of something, um, but actually writing it down is that act of, right, I've had to put this in words and there's some level of commitment there. Um, but lots of different ways you can go about application. Uh, we'll often maybe just verbally do application and sort of get people to choose, maybe get three people to write it or share it and get everyone to choose one of those three that most suits them. Um, just depends on yeah, how you're going for time at the end there, but we don't want to forget application. It you know, makes a difference. So, yeah, lots of good things there. Um, preparation, messaging God's word. Um, yeah, don't use this app. That's fine as well. This is the first time I've used it for... Um, so the Swedish method, it's just that it might be easier with all of us here. Uh, so you can all see everyone's responses, a bit more motivation. Um, can you scroll back up for me, Steve, there as well? Um, giving it a go, yep. Using an anonym, anonymized uh, idea can be helpful. Great. Um, just jump back to the other slideshow. So if we're doing this, it would be um, great for everyone to, the one that they wrote down, actually take, you know, put in their Bible, put it where they're going to see it, to take that home, if you're doing it on pieces of paper, um, so they have something they can take with them for the application to be reminded of throughout the week. It may be that these lead into your prayer time, and so take that application, break into smaller groups, share it with the other people in your group, and pray as part of your prayer, pray for that application in your life that week as well. Um, but it's really a great chance to formalise any things that came up during the conversations to um, put it down here. Accountability is really hard to do with this. Um, it's yeah, hard to get right because we don't want to go down the legalistic part that we're just, we've had some head knowledge here and now we're saying you have to do this and I'm going to check on in, in on you and make sure you've done this but there's no heart change behind it. Um, so yeah, it's difficult to get that balance. 
Um, so I'm keen to hear ideas of how you can, how you're doing that with your group, that accountability level and helping to do that well. Um, one of the things I do recommend, I guess application is pretty much setting goals for your next actions, right? And so iSmart is something that uh, is often mentioned with, with goal setting. So having a goal that's it's an acronym, individual um, or inspirational, uh, so something that they actually are excited about doing, applying, something that's specific, so it's not just oh, I'm going to read my Bible more. Well, what does that actually look like to read your Bible more? Um, how much more? When are you going to do that? And that goes the next one, so it's measurable, something you can actually go, did I do it or not? Um, something that's achievable um, or attainable and uh, realistic and then timely. You're actually going to buy this particular time. I want to actually have done this particular thing. Now, again, I wouldn't go, okay, we've got to go through everyone's application, make sure it checks all these boxes, but just as a guide of what people should be thinking about when you're talking about application, often it gets a bit airy-fairy and just sort of, it's very hard to measure is what am I going to be doing, what's come to mind, what I want to actually change to be more like Jesus as a result of what we've done tonight. So thinking about how can it be a bit more specific and actually have that accountability um, is helpful in application. All right, I think there's yeah, a couple of things extra. I'll send these slides out, um, but yeah, looking at once you've been doing this for a while, you can add in some other stuff. I like that second one about who's someone that could benefit from something you've learnt tonight, and so writing their name down and when you, you'll have the opportunity to share that with them. Um, and then last one, Steve, um, it's just some reflection questions, but we've yeah, run out of time there. So, but just thinking what would the difficulties be? You've probably thought of some of those already, but also what would the big wins be if you were to use this with your group or if you've already been using it, what are you finding really helpful? Um, so I think we're going to spend some time in prayer. So maybe as you do pray for your group, thinking about yeah, um, uh, praying to be doing this better or to uh, be thinking of using this and what, could, what difference it could make is something you can be praying for too. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Lyndon. Let's give Lyndon a clap. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was up. I couldn't even read half of what was going on, but I did learn a lot. So um, the the point is that we we can think about how to um, make this changing in our practice. So. Um, uh, we don't want to say that you have to do the Swedish method. There will be other methods that we do, but we're thinking that Philippians could be a good book to practice this on. So this could be the the, uh, the Job, we're thinking, may not be quite the same. But um, now I'm just going to ask Fee if she could come up. You want to come up and just give us a very quick... Yeah, okay, well, I'd... we've got 10 minutes. Okay, we'll do it next time. Yeah, okay, maybe too much input. So... What we want to do is now spend the remaining 10 minutes uh, praying through perhaps uh, something that you want to achieve, apply in the group. Perhaps there's um, uh, a goal that you'd like to achieve this, this term. Pray through that. Maybe there's a, um, a, a problem that you, you'd like to pray through or, or um, uh, just some area of growth that you want to see. So it's pretty broad. But I th I'm going to suggest we get together in the in our um, groups that uh, we we lead studies with. So, if you're if you're with say Chris Henbury and he's got a couple, he's got Dino with him, and and a few other guys, then can you guys connect together and talk about your group and pray about your group. But if you're here on your own, then just sit with another one or two other leaders and pray with them. And um, yeah, and so just. Um, Try and, try and either go with your group or with someone else and then you can, you can just share um, briefly and then pray, I think. Don't spend too much time sharing because we've only got 10 minutes. Right, let's do it. <laughs>